teachers um, last Wednesday and today, we're finishing the course, meaning that we're doing chapter 13. So if you were here last time, pay close attention, because remember that stuff is a little tricky. If you weren't here last time, pay extra close attention, because this stuff will be on the desk. We are not meeting on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we're off for Thanksgiving. So you should have none of your classes should be meeting on Wednesday. The first week we're back next week, on both Monday and Wednesday, we're doing our special subnet masking lecture. That's one hell of a difficult lecture. I expect all the smart students to be here and listen to it. That will not be on the final exam, but you might want to listen to it because it's a very difficult lecture, and it will help you a lot in getting a job. And then the week after that, the second week, we'll be doing a review, and I, I don't know exact date yet, but I think the beginning of the third week in in December is our uh, is our test. So one last time, the next test is chapter 10, chapter 12, and chapter 13. We're finishing up chapter 13 today. If you were not here at my last lecture, please listen carefully to today's lecture because you're going to need it for the test coming up. The test coming up is the middle of December. It's on 10, 12, and 13. The first week back, we're doing our special subnet masking lecture which I hope you'll find interesting. And if you're smart, you better pay close attention to it. I'm trying to get everybody who's coming in. But we're near the end of the semester. So we only have either three or four weeks left, depending upon how you look at it. Actually, we have three weeks left, depending on how you look at it. Okay? And we'll probably get out a little early today because it's Thanksgiving. Can I remind you? I, I think all your classes on Wednesday are not there. So you should have nothing to do Wednesday. Check with your other teachers, but Wednesday's a day off. If you have any classes tomorrow and Tuesday, you have to go to them. But any classes on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, you don't have to go to them. I'm still doing attendance, sorry. So if there's any good news, I hope you've enjoyed this. We're basically finishing up the new material when? Today, right now. All right, I think I have everybody I can see. If I miss somebody, that's their hard luck because I screwed up. All right, having said all that, then let me minimize, maximize. Now, remember, if you were not here at the last lecture, which you're not here on Wednesday, you better pay close attention to this. If you weren't here, you might want to pay close attention too because this stuff is a little bit tricky. It's that uh, stuff on the uh, backup and uh, it's a little bit tricky. All right. This is the last of the new material. Let me minimize, minimize. Sorry about it. I have to do this every time, but I can't do much about it. <sighs> yeah, if I missed anybody attendance-wise, I don't know what to do about it. Okay, here we go. Uh, chapter 13, we're skipping all the crap at the beginning, and we're doing all the stuff near the end, but this stuff would or could be on the test. Okay, we'll talk about ping trace route, we'll talk about network monitors, and then we'll finish off with that special lecture on how to do the backup, and then we'll go home a little early and we're done with the course. Please don't miss the next Monday and Wednesday for the special lecture. Okay. Ping, are you there? Yes or no? So what does ping do? Ping test connectivity. Are you there? Yes or no? It uses ICMP echo request, but don't worry so much about that. Okay. This is the one you had a little bit of trouble with. Um, if I want to see why I can't ping you, you're not there. I might want to know why. So IP config, what is my IP address? Again, those who took notes last time, just go over it. Those who were not here last time should be taking notes. IP config, do I have an IP address? Sometimes I'm trying to troubleshoot why I couldn't ping you. So first of all, do I have an address? Yes, I do. Okay, isn't that great? Now, ping the loopback address. 127.001 is not an actual address. It's called the loopback address. And it's the expression, go ping yourself. So if I ping 127.001, I'm pinging my own address. What I'm doing is saying, can I reach out onto the network and come back and touch my other shoulder? 
Can I reach out onto the network and come back and touch my other shoulder? Pinging the loopback address is ping your own IP address. We would all put 127.0.0.1, but in my case, it would be 192.14.12.8. In your case, it would be 192.14.12.9. So first, IP config. Do I have an address? Then I'm going to ping myself. Now I'm all set, right? Well, no, I still can't reach you. So what's the next step? The next step is ping a local IP address. That's merely since I ping myself. Now, why don't I ping somebody near me? Why don't I ping you right over there or you right over there? Ping somebody close by. So ping an address that's not me, but somebody nearby. Can I get myself? And now can I get you? So if I can touch you and you come back and say, yes, you have connectivity with me, now you and I are talking. Now, have I solved the problem? No, I just now that you and I, some close by are talking. I still know why I can't get to him over there. Next, ping the default gateway. What's the default gateway? The address of the router that leaves this network. Ping the doorway to this network. Ping the address that would take me off this LAN. So ping somebody in this room, which is the local IP address, then ping the doorway to get me off this LAN. See what I'm doing? I'm pinging further and further. First ping myself, then ping somebody next to me, then ping the doorway. Now the one that screws me up a little bit, it says ping an IP address of a host. Well, wait, didn't you do this? What they mean by this is ping a computer past the doorway. So first I ping somebody right near me that's inside my LAN. Then I ping the doorway to my LAN. That's the default gateway. Now ping somebody past the default gateway to see can I get through the doorway. That would be ping the address of a host past the doorway. This next one is ping somebody by name instead of by number because now you'll want to see is DNS is resolving the name to the number. See what I mean? So ping an address of a host, then ping a name of a host to see if the name and address are being resolved. And finally, I think ping the DNS servers and NS lookup. What you're trying to do with this is ping somebody a little further away each time to see why you haven't got connectivity. Now, if you type in IP config and says, I ain't got an IP address, that explains it right there. But if you have an IP address and you still can't ping somebody else, now start doing this, 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 to see how far you can go. Okay, that's that topic. Next one, trace route. Well, ping has one big problem. I know you're there, you're not there. But if you're in California, it just says, yes, I, I, yes, I'm here. I have connectivity. Yes, I'm here. That's it. How did I get to you? Can't tell me. Trace route shows how I got there. Trace route shows me the route I took. Trace route, show me the route I took. Now, my favorite slide is this one coming up here. See, it shows this thing here. And I guess you can't see it too well. It's not that big. But what it's saying is, I went through uh, this address to 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 this address. And it gave me every address of every router I went through to get to California. Oh, that's pretty interesting, but why do I care? Well, because it only gave me the address, it gave me the name of the router. Now, this router's name is IPQuest.net. It doesn't tell me much. But this router is called what? Los Angeles 1. And this router is called what? San Diego 1. And this router is called Lunar Pages 1. So I know I went through Los Angeles and San Diego to get to what's called the Lunar Pages router. Now, I could look up where the Lunar Pages router is geographically and find out. So it tells me the router by number and name that I went through. And since most routers are named intelligently, that is first floor, second floor router, San Diego, Tulsa router, Bronx, Queens router, that kind of thing, the router should give me an idea of the path that I took. How do I get that? I only get this, this um, picture if I use trace route. Trace route is ping on steroids or pay, trace route is ping with what? with details with details okay we all got that i'm moving ahead slowly i'm not doing this lecture again so i'm doing this second time but i ain't doing it a third or fourth time um network monitors monitor in other words they they monitor traffic that's easy what do you think a network monitor does it monitors traffic that's all it does the cuidado and the tricky one for a test is this one. A protocol analyzer is not a network monitor. 
But a protocol analyzer is the only one that lets you actually capture a packet. Now you say, well, why is it important you capture a packet? Because when you capture the packet, let's revert back to chapter two or three and we learn what a packet was. A packet was a to and from IP address and data. Remember that? Well, if I capture the to and from IP address and read it, I know that it's going from you to you. How do I know it's going from you to you? Not you by name, but you by IP address. And not you by name, but you by IP address. So I know who it's going from and to if I capture the packet. And then the data part is in ones and zeros, but it's in binary. And the protocol analyzer can read it. So it says this data says four score and seven years ago. That means I know that you are sending you a copy of the Gettysburg Address. You can capture and read the packet with a protocol analyzer. Now, when a good guy does this, this is a traffic analyzer. When a bad guy does it, it's called hacking. So if I'm doing it on my network, I'm trying to see who's doing what and figure it out so I can make the network more efficient. But if I'm an evil bad guy doing it, I could be trying to eavesdrop on what you're sending to you. It's a neutral thing. It's like a hammer or a screwdriver. It can be used for bad or good. So a protocol analyzer is a sniffer and it captures the packets. Capturing the packets let me also read the contents of the packet. Can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. Okay. I'm skipping all this. All right, now here's what we get. I'm doing this lecture over again, but we, we, we've been to it now. If you remember in chapter uh, 12, the one before this, remember this is chapter 13. So chapter 12, which I already did, we want to do disaster recovery. And the disaster recovery in chapter 12 was, I had to do fault tolerance, and we did that already. That's the RAID 1 and RAID 5, and I will be reviewing that at some point. You need that for the final. We also need backup. Now let's go down this lecture very slowly. Fault tolerance says you're never going to lose the data. It's going to be there, so you'll never lose it. Remember RAID 1, you duplicate it with mirroring. In RAID 5, you do the disk striping, so if one disk fails, the other can bring the data back automatically. So you're not going to lose the data. So you're safe. You can relax, right? But you're also going to back it up. Well, why? If I'm not going to lose it, why do I got to back it up? Standard procedure is fault tolerance to not lose it and back up in case you do lose it. So today's lecture is not on fault tolerance. We did that last time. We may review it sometime. Today's lecture is on backup. And we have to know all that gibberish. And I'm going to go very slowly and repeat it, but not a third time. <laughs> okay? So determine what data should be backed up and how often. Well, most people back up something every day. And what most people do is they back up everything every night. But what data should be backed up? I'll give you a hint. You know what you should back up? Everything. There's nothing that should be not be backed up. So should you back this up and not that? Should you maybe back up this and skip that? No, you should back up everything. Okay? And how often? How often? Basically, all the time. All the time. Okay? And the schedule is every day. Now, the cuidado about identifying people. You got to make sure someone backs up every single night. So you can't say, gee, I thought it was your turn. Gee, I thought it was your turn. Generally, the backups are automated. But you got to be sure that every night a backup is run. And if it's not run, you're fired because it's got to be run. And then the testing of it regularly is some people back it up for years and never have to have, it, have to restore it. And the first time they got to restore it, oh, my God, I, it doesn't work. You should test it regularly every two weeks every month make sure you can do a restore that you that you're back you're not backing up into a outdated tape or you're not backing up into into the, uh, oblivion and not have the data there gee i thought it was working well when did you test it well i never tested i just thought it was working now that i need the data i ain't got it okay so always make sure the backup happens it's very important now here's the big lecture you're worried about i may have to get my marker i'll see if i have to so let's, let's, let's see if I have to. I did it last time. Take notes if you missed it, because this will be on my test. So a full backup is backing up everything. And what most people do is on Sunday, they back up all their files. And on Monday, they back up all their files. And on Tuesday, they back up all their files. And every day, they back everything up. That's a full backup every day. Is it legal? Yes. And does it work? Yes. 
Never do a full backup once in a while and nothing else. If you're going to do a full backup, do it every day. Okay? End of lecture. We can all go home. The problem is it's not that efficient, and I'll tell you why. You probably have about 20,000 files. But in one day, on my, and you backed up everything on Sunday night, so you got all 20,000 files backed up. When you come to work on, on Monday, you altered two or three files. You altered two or three, and you altered maybe three or four, and you altered maybe two or three yourself. So the total files you altered on Monday is maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 15 files. Now remember, you got 20,000 files, but you only changed five of them on Monday. Why do you have to back up the other 19,000? You didn't change on Monday. You got them backed up from Sunday night, so why, why back them up again? And you don't have to. So let's try an incremental backup. Why not on Monday night, I just back up all the files I changed only on Monday? And why not on Tuesday night, I just back up all the files I changed only on Tuesday? Now remember, the files I didn't change were backed up on Sunday night, and they're still there. So Monday night, I back up all the files I changed on Monday night, and Tuesday night, I just back up the files I changed on Tuesday night. Wednesday night comes. What are you going to do? Just back up Wednesday changes Wednesday night. What about Thursday? Just back up Thursday changes on Thursday night. What have you done? You've made more efficient and shortened the time it takes to do a backup. So every Sunday, you backed up everything. But on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you just backed up the changes for that day. Is that a good idea? It's far more efficient. One minor problem, and you got to think this out if you're smart. So if you had a failure on Thursday night, you would have to restore Sunday's tape and Monday's tape and Tuesday's tape and Wednesday's tape and Thursday's tape. Now tell me why. Because on Sunday, you backed up everything. Now, the ones that weren't changed, that's your Sunday backup. And you've lost everything on Thursday. But on Monday, you had to have all the Monday changes. you got to put them back in. Tuesday, you just had all of Tuesday changes. you got to put them back in. See what I mean? When, so it makes the restore process a little bit longer. But it does save you time. Is a full and incremental backup okay? It is. Smart person says, Professor, is there a better way to do it? And here's, here comes the drama. So what if on Sunday night I back up everything? Okay. Now, differential backup. Monday I back up all of Monday's changes, but listen carefully. On Tuesday, I back up both Monday and Tuesday changes. Differential backup. And on Wednesday, I back up all the changes I made on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And on Thursday, I back up all the changes I made Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And on Friday, I back up all the changes I made Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Aren't you backing up Monday changes over and over again? I am. Is it a little bit longer? It is. But what's the catch or what's the advantage? If I have a crash on, say, Wednesday or Thursday night, all I've got to restore is Sunday's tape and Thursday's tape, or Sunday's tape and Wednesday's tape. I don't got to restore Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. See what I mean? So let's try it one more time. Incremental backup, or backup only the changes made that day. Differential backup, backup only the changes made since the last full backup. All the changes made since the beginning of the week, the differential. Differential again. Monday, you back up Monday changes. Tuesday, you back up Monday and Tuesday changes. Wednesday, you back up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay, a couple of cuidados. Full and incremental, that's okay. Full and differential, that's okay. But you never, never, never combine incremental and differential. One more time. Full and incremental, legal and okay. Full and differential, legal and okay. Incremental and differential combined together, not legal, not okay. Don't ever do it. We're still not done with this with this slide. I'm going to do the A bit, but let me just go on. So what does it say here? A good model for creating a backup schedule combines a weekly full backup with a daily differential backup. One more time. A good model would be a weekly full backup with a daily differential backup, understanding what a differential backup is. We all got all this? Okay. 340, we're finishing up, but we're going to go back and do that A-bit stuff.
I don't know if I have to plug in my little uh, writing thing or not. Again, the people who were here, and I know who they were, they're pretty smart. You're seeing this for the second time. I know you don't like to see my lectures repeated, but you won't see it a third time. Be sure you know it. Those people who are absent, and I'm not going to call their names out, you better be writing this down because it will be on the final. Okay, so we're done, right? Well, it says the full backup. It says copies all the selected files to selected media, and it says marks the files as backed up. I don't see how I can do this without doing that. I hope you're enjoying teaching online because I'm not enjoying doing it. I hope you're learning from it. I'm just not sure. When you're done with the class and I've given you a grade, I'd like some of you to send me an email as to how much you like it. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's give this a try. Okay. So A is called the archive bit. Okay. It's a it's a bit that pops up. It's a file, it's a file of um permission, if you will, or a file bit. But I'm going to paraphrase that. It's called the archive bit, but I'm going to change it to say archive required. Because what I'm trying to tell you is when the archive bit is up, it means it has not been backed up and it needs to be backed up. So the A bit is archive required. So what happens is it says that this guy copies all files selected media and marks the files as backed up. I'm going to change a little bit what I did. What this is does, it takes the A bit and it what? It lowers it. It removes the A bit. Why? When you go in on Sunday, you haven't backed anything up. The A bit should be up. Once you back up everything, when you mark the files as backed up, what are you actually doing? You're marking the files as backed up. You're lowering the A bit. Now, how do you know on Monday what files were changed? Well, since the A bit is lower than all the files, any file you change on Monday, it will pop up. You say, wait. This is my life story. I already backed it up. Yes, you already backed it up, but today you added a paragraph to it. You've never backed up the new version. The old version's backed up. The new one wasn't. So therefore, the A popped up. Now, what does this say? It says here that it says, and marks the file. Oh, stop that. Was I don't know what's happening here. This is driving me nuts. And marks the files as backed up. I'm in the wrong place. Okay, so what that says is, no, I can't get to it. Ink tools, there it is. So what that says is, marks the files as backed up. That says you're also going to take the A bit and you're going to lower it because you backed it up. And then Tuesday, the A pops up for the ones you change Tuesday, and when you back them up, that goes down. Next Wednesday, that goes down. But look at this one. With the differential, it says it does not mark the files as backed up. That means the A bit remains the same. You don't lower it. You leave it up. So watch what happens. When you, back, when you make some changes on Monday, the A pops up, and you're going to back them up. But if you mark them as backed up, then on Tuesday, you wouldn't back up Monday and Tuesday. You'd only back up Tuesday. So you have to not mark it as backed up so that you'll back up Monday's changes on Monday, but you'll also back up Monday's changes on Tuesday, but you'll also back up Monday's changes on Wednesday, but you'll also back up Monday's changes on Thursday. So understanding when you lower A and when you don't lower A is very, very important. So let's do it again. The archive bit doesn't mean it's been archived. The archive bit means it needs to be archived. So whenever you put a brand new version file on anywhere, the archive bit is always up. I know what you're going to say. I don't notice it. There's no A bit because you never went and looked for it. If you ran the command that shows what the bits are, you'd see an archive bit up on a file. You just never see it because you didn't look for it. As soon as you back it up, even once, 
your market is backed up by doing what? By lowering the archive bit. You lower the archive bit, okay? As soon as you do an incremental backup, you you back it up and your market is backed up. How do your market is backed up? You lower the archive bit. But we just said with a differential backup, you copy the file, but you don't market as backed up. Well, if you don't market as backed up, how do you not market as backed up? You leave the A bit up. Now, I know what you're going to say. If you leave it up, um, isn't that confusing? I mean, you, you backed it up, but you didn't have a record of it. That's true. And only if you pick a differential backup is that needed to do that. Normally, if you back it up, it'll immediately say, yes, you backed it up. With the differential, it will say, I can't mark it as backed up, because if I did, I wouldn't be able to repeat it tomorrow, the next day, the next day. Now, let me just stop for a few minutes. I hope you understand all this. People say, well, all this techno babble, do I really need to know it? Well, A, yes, you need to know it if you're going to get the Net Plus exam. But B, when you go to any kind of sexy or sophisticated backup, automatic backup tools, and you click on a menu, it will say, are you picking full incremental or differential? But it doesn't explain what full incremental or differential is. It assumes that you know what you're picking. See what I mean? And again, what do we say on the next slide? Full and incremental is okay. It's not the best. It's legal. Full and differential is the best one. And the next slide it said full and differential is the best one to pick. But remember, you never are allowed to combine incremental and differential. And now I think you'll see why. It would be very confusing if we sometimes marked this backed up and we sometimes didn't. So when the system is this combined with this, it knows what to do. When the system is this combined with this, it knows what to do. But when the system is trying to combine these two, it says, I have no clue where I'm going here. I can't figure this out. I don't know what I'm doing. See what I mean? So understanding these backup types is, is important. And yes, it could or would be on my final exam. And yes, it could or would be on the actual Net Plus exam. So you see why this two slides is kind of tricky and why the archive required bit is so important. The differential doesn't mark it as backed up and leaves it alone. The incremental does mark it as backed up and lowers it and understand about inferential, differential, and how they combine together. And then one more time, what does it say? A good model for getting a backup schedule combines a weekly full and a daily differential. That's the preferable model. That's the one we want. Everybody okay with this? Now, I, I, I was just going to leave it at this, but I think what I'm going to do is, so that would be on the test. What I think I'm going to do is just one more thing to try to combine them. So maybe I can just minimize this and go ahead and... Son of a gun. Uh, just somebody answer me. Are you seeing the PowerPoint? Am I sharing it or not? Uh, I... Are you seeing a PowerPoint? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. good. So I want to know. Now, in the previous slide, we talked about this. We talked about, I'm just going to go through this quickly, and then we're going to go home. We talked about backup and fault tolerance, okay? And we talked about regular backups and regular backups. Well, that's the one I just talked about, is the backups, see? So back them in full time. Don't lose the data to begin with, but know about the backup. All right, we're going to finish when I finish with this. Now, we finished this backup lecture today. That's the one. But you've got to combine that with the fault tolerant thing. So the fault tolerant thing, I'm going to do this quickly, is have an uninterruptible power supply with a built-in battery. So if it crashes, the power doesn't leave, and you can keep going. That's the biggie. But the real biggie is this one. Make sure you don't lose your data by doing this. This mirroring RAID 1. I'm not going to draw this time because we did it before. Two disks. Whatever's on one disk is duplicated on the other disk. That's your RAID 1. So if one disk fails, the other one takes over, you shouldn't lose the data. Now, this one's trickier. That's the one that had uno, dos, tres. We had cuatro disks, right? If one disk fails, we did lose the data temporarily. But if I send, say, Mr. Lopez out to a disk store and he put a virgin disk in there without having any backup and restore, if only one disk of the five failed, the other disk with the parity would automatically spring back and give me that information. So this is also considered fault tolerant because, yes, 
we do lose the data for the moment the disk is down. But as soon as we put the new disk in, it comes back. See, if this all works, you never need the backup. What we're trying to do is do the best of everything. Assume this will work, but if it doesn't work, we still want the backup. Right? And then the final one on this one was this guy here, and that was what's called server clustering. That's really what we would call server mirroring. And I don't want to go over this right now, but here it was. We have two or three whole servers. With this one, we mirror the entire disk. With this one, we mirror the entire file server. So if server one fails, another copy of server one takes over. If server four fails, another copy of server one takes over. It's called server clustering, but it's really server mirroring. And understand the difference between the failover and load balancing. So what I'm really trying to show you with this is this. Backup and fault tolerance go together. We just did the backup. And yes, you have to know the uh, differential versus incremental, which one does what, which one lowers the A bit, which one does. But yes, you have to know that. But you combine that, and that would be on the test. But you combine that with this stuff, and it would also be on the test. Undirectable power supply, uh, which of these is which and how they work, and which of these is which and how they work. I just one other thing I'm going to mention that I just saw on the slide that I'm just going to talk a little bit about. I didn't see it was there. And that is this volume shadow copy service. If you remember, back in the beginning of, I think, this chapter, we did something about NFS. And how NFS had things called disk quotas, and NFS had things called um, file compression, but the big deal with NFS was it had all these um, permissions, and that was a big deal. And yes, you would want to know that for my test too. One of the things that NFS also has is something called volume shadow copy. And I'm just going to explain this, which means even open files can be backed up. It used to be in the old days that if you had a file open was working on it, we couldn't back it up. So if you were fat, dumb, and happy and staring at the ceiling sound asleep, I can back up all your files. But if you're working like a busy beaver working hard and you've got a file open, I couldn't back it up. Why? You can't back up open files. That's why they used to only back up at 2 in the morning. So they'd back up at 2 in the morning when everybody was asleep, and they would actually force you to log off the network and back you up at 2 in the morning. They've solved this by something called the volume shadow copy. And what they're saying is, if you're using NTFS, all files have a shadow copy or duplicate copy there. Why? If you've got your file open, you're changing it, but your volume shadow copy is still there and it's closed. So if they go along and try to back up, they'll back up your current file, your current file, your current file. Now they come to you. Well, you're one of these eager beavers. You're busy working to two in the morning. So, gee, I can't back you up. What I'll do is I'll go in and back up your shadow copy instead, because even though your real file is open, your shadow copy isn't. The secret to volume shadow copies is, for the first time, I can back up your file even while it's open. Now, be careful. I'm saying something very false. I'm not backing up your actual file. I'm backing up the volume shadow copy of your file, which will not have the latest things in it. So if I'm backing up right now and you're making changes, those changes will not be in there. But any changes you made an hour ago or a day ago, they will be in there. See what I mean? What does volume shadow copy do? It allows you to back up open files that, that uh, I'm sorry, it allows you to back up a file while it's open, which didn't used to be the case. Now, is it actually backing up the open file? No, it's backing up the shadow copy, but at least you're not left out. In the old days, your file wouldn't have been in there. Say, so, hey, this is important. Why didn't you back me up? Well, sorry, when the backup run, uh, program ran, you were busy. Well, what was I going to do with it? Your file was open, and the, cop, and the thing can't back up an open file. You had it open. I didn't want to tap you on the shoulder and say, close it down so I can back it up and open it again because you're busy working. So I didn't back it up at all. Well, this time I back up the shadow copy, and I do back it up. One last time, I'm going to stop in a few minutes because I think we're done with two things. We're done today, and we may be done with the course. Understand all about backup and all about uh, what we covered today about incremental, differential, and the archive bit but also understand all about fault tolerance, RAID 1, RAID 5, disk mirroring, striping with parity, understand about the server clustering, which is really server mirroring, understand about the failover cluster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, let me just talk for a minute or two 
and we may be able to leave. Um, the next test is on chapter 10, 12, and 13. We've just covered 10, 12, and 13. A week, and remember, we're off Wednesday. I don't want to see anybody Wednesday because the whole school's closed. Monday and Wednesday of next week, we're doing my special lecture on subnet masking. It will not be on the final, but I want the smart people here, especially here, to listen to it. It's interesting. And again, for the two or three people in this class who think they're going to take the Net Plus exam, you would need it for that. Okay? The week after the first week back, we'll do a review, and the week after that, we'll have a test on Chapter 10, 12, and 13, and we will be done by, I think, the second or third week in December, which is when it ends. I haven't decided the exact day. I'm going to try to give the test on a Monday, like I always do, with the review on a Thursday. Okay? You must take that fourth test, and your entire grade will be on test one, two, three, and four. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute. Does anybody have any questions on anything? If not, um, do not come in Wednesday, but do come in next Monday, and we'll have a very lengthy lecture. I see somebody else who got here. I can write you in.